What's up YouTube, it's Brian Sosag with the Man in Black Leather Studio. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you how I make my wallets. Check it out. <clears throat> All right, so we got our wallet front here. I'm currently casing it. Start getting this soaking up some water. So we're gonna be drawing, carving, doing all kinds of stuff with it. First order of business is we want to mark our panels, you can call them. We got a front side and we got a back side. Sometimes I like running the art the whole way. And sometimes I like running it with two panels, a front and a back. This particular wallet is going to have a front and a back. And this piece should be pretty cool. So I want to kind of give this thing a little touch of everything. We have a little bit of figure carving, a little bit of floral, a little bit of geometric stamps. Um, just kind of pull out all the stops, I guess you could say. And I have this really cool, this looks like a, a painting or a sketch of a bowl. And we're trying to position it. I kind of want to make his, I kind of want to make his foot uh, or his hoof kind of like the bottom, at the very bottom corner. So his body is almost going to act like the new uh, border. So we get it into position. So this is the front side of the wallet. It will fold shut like so. So this is the front of the wallet, which is where we're gonna go crazy with our figure carving here. And I'm just gonna trace it. If you've ever watched a leather crafting video before, you've probably seen this technique or you know, anytime anybody kind of traces or tools something. Once the leather is damp, um, we can kind of rub it here and trace an image out on the paper and it will magically transfer for us. Now, when it comes to trying to trace a, uh, a figure like this, you know, a bull or something kind of realistic, you can easily get carried away trying to transfer too much of the image. And then you kind of are left with this kind of mess or you can trace a nice balance of lines where you know you're not tracing every single little detail but you're still getting the structure and the lines that you need which i usually trace a couple body lines here and there just to kind of indicate for example like this thigh there's not necessarily really a line for me to trace like the outline but there is a little bit of shape and musculature that we want to uh, try and grab and transfer to our wallet here. I guess this is pretty good. Okay, as you can see, I got a line going through this dude right here. You can kind of rub it out. It might be a tiny bit visible from here, but when you see by the end, after all the textures and other stuff we're gonna do, that little line is going to disappear. So I'm actually super hyped on this thing already. I'm thinking about drawing my vine kind of this way, but I don't know, I don't, it seems just kind of droopy. Like I don't like the direction if it were to just come down like this, like although it does make sense for the space and the design because we kind of have this bull who's gonna be standing here um, really prominent. We can kind of play like that, but the more I kind of stare at it, the more I don't like that idea. So I think I might, I might come go the opposite direction. I think I might kind of start it in the corner here. Yeah, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna do one of these kind of flowers that the vine will kind of come out of. You might have seen that trick before. I do it every once in a while. There's plenty of other uh, really kick-ass artists that do that as well. It's kind of a cool, unique way to start a vine. So I wanna make a line of flow like this. This is all kind of really light sketchy stuff. I'm trying to still have this thing speak to me. It kind of looks like it's going in the bull's butt to be honest. And I don't really care for how that <laughs> how that appears. So I might do like a flower here. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a flower that drops down right here. Probably gonna throw a leaf up here or something just to kind of help fill this space. And then this guy will attach. Is maybe I can pull a vine here 
and then I can bring a loop out. I think it'd be really cool. It's tricky whenever you're doing figure carving because, or animals, because sometimes you get this weird dead space, uh, you know, between the legs where it's not really easy to kind of force floral down in there. I'm thinking about maybe trying to wrap a big looping kind of swirl. I'm not sure. The tail, so I might have to like kind of fabricate the tail, make it more like swishy or something. So I actually really like this. And then here too, it kind of can appear as if he's stepping on the vine, which I kind of like that. So cool, cool. It's working out for us. That, so there's not a ton of dead space. So having this be three petals is almost pointless. So I guess we're just gonna turn it into an imaginary two petal. Because there, this is a kind of a, now that I'm looking at it, a really strange piece. I almost kind of boxed myself into a corner that I'm not necessarily happy about, especially on this uh, video here could run another flower out which I don't think would look terrible actually I really like how that looks so this one will be like a double peddler and then this one will have as like a triple peddler okay I actually really like that and then that way we can go here we can have this vine kind of come up and out and in here kind of behind okay so that is what we have for the front side. Um, I know it looks really sketchy and maybe a little bit scratchy and hard to see, but it's all part of the plan. I really like to draw lightly and kind of sketch and mold and sculpt. We wanna have somewhat of a nice balance. So because we have floral coming out from this corner, we can have it mirrored or we can kind of have it opposite, which I like it mirrored, so we're gonna do another corner. We're gonna do another corner flower. And we wanna get some kind of geometric stamp going. I don't know if I'm gonna do basket weave or something else, I'm not sure. But what we wanna do is, we wanna kinda of mirror the pattern if we want a nice balance, just, just like, you know, design wise. So what I'm gonna do is kind of, what I could actually probably even do is pull, yeah, here's what I'm gonna do to be as semi-accurate as possible. I'm gonna come back with the pencil, which it shouldn't really leave as aggressive as a mark, which I don't know if you can actually pick that up on camera, but we have a shape somewhere like this, which, which we're not gonna fill like perfectly and basically have a reverse image of the steer. I don't think that would look good. Um, we're going to kind of just go with the rough shape. So when you look at it from a distance, it's at least nice and balanced. I'm going to come in here. I want to do a big spiral. Um, we're only going to do one flower on the back side, just so we can get some nice like little bit of vine work going. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now defies all uh, sense and logic. I'm gonna come back in with an eraser and lightly get rid of it. We don't wanna erase super crazy hard and get rid of all of our drawing. This bowl is gonna be tricky to uh, carve and tool. So I'm going to get warmed up on the backside first. Now when it comes to doing animals, 
I usually try and get the key features done first. For example, what's probably the first thing you recognize or you think of when you think of a bull? The horns. And you want to make sure the shape of the head is going to be good. Make sure those eyes don't look crazy. Okay, so here's what we got for the carving. I think I'm gonna go with this diamond diamond pattern kind of geometric stamp. I wanna make a mark line for that. So first thing I wanna do is get this diamond pattern started. Some people like to do the geometrics after they're done tooling. I personally like to do it before I tool just because you can kind of get better angles, um, especially with a larger geometric stamp. Like that diamond doesn't look that big, but it, it kind of is awkward and large and kind of weirdly shaped. So you really have to pitch it at an angle in certain situations. Taking our little bevelers, and we're gonna give this thing some dimension. Okay, so there we have all of our beveling done. We got our geometric patterns done. So now what we're going to do is move into texturing. These are my two big texturing tools. With leather tooling, everything is being pushed down. So once you start at the top, you can kind of work your layers down and keep pushing the, the, the lower layer down farther back. And then the next layer that's down, you push that farther back. And you kind of just go along with that process. Next, we're gonna do our backgrounder, which I use actually uh, backgrounder stamps or like matting stamps. Some people like using backgrounders, which are like the little circles and the little seeds. I am not a big fan of that look, so I like just good old fashioned, uh, you know, kind of cross hatched backgrounders. And what we're gonna do with the backgrounders is basically smash down all these background chunks. Um, the backgrounders are going to really give the illusion that the floral is sitting on the surface. Um, basically how these, how you get depth and dimension and like different types of layering will all be dependent on how many different layers you have going. The thing that's going to make it pop the most is once you start smashing down these backgrounders, that's going to actually give us another basically layer of depth and you'll see here on this side once i'm done with the backgrounder what i'm talking about it really just makes that floral pop and appear as if it's like sitting on the surface of the leather rather than being like a part of the leather itself boom there we go. So what we're going to do next is give ourselves some decorative cuts. And these are just basically small little 
kind of scratches, but this is just gonna add another little layer of texturing. So this is just adding some lines kind of to accentuate these petals and the different uh, directions they're going. I have a video on what is called, <laughs> I have a video on what I like to call lines of flow. This kind of goes into great depths about um, basically what you can do to make your piece appear as flowy as possible. And one of those things is having as many lines moving in the same direction as you can. It's gonna give the illusion of fullness as well as length. We're kind of creating a little bit of an optical illusion here. Okay, so there we have our design for the most part. All we gotta do is give this bowl some attention. Now, whenever I do figure carvings, I do kind of a combination of bevelers. So I'm using those same bevelers as I used before, but I'm just coming back and using them with my hand. And then also coming back with my actual molding tool. I'll be the first one to admit I'm not necessarily the uh, best best figure carver out there. Figure carving is actually something I feel like I uh, could improve on. So every time I, I do some kind of figure carving, I really try and either try something new, really just try and push myself, I guess, in any kind of way. On this nostril here. Cool. All right. So, I think I'm gonna call that good for now. Um, what we gotta do now is let this guy dry some time and then we're going to add back in uh, some colors. All right, so we're gonna come in here and stain this. Got a big old tub of uh, Phoebe's Antique. This one's gonna be medium brown. I'm gonna start off on the back side. Let me get the front side. I like using the uh, using a toothbrush or a brush of some kind because it really helps get down in the cracks of the tooling. When you're using more of a paste, that can be kind of tricky. All right, and then here's where the stain magic comes. I use these blue shop towels, which is gonna create a pretty flat surface like this. So as I wipe off, you're gonna see all the stain gets left in the background and the stain will get removed off the top, kind of flat layers that are left. And this gives us really crazy depth, as you can see here. Let's see how this bowl turned out. Sick. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually clean this up. I don't know how it looks on the filming of this, um, but it's kind of muddy. Everything's kind of a little bit dark. So we're gonna come back with our resist coat. I use acrylic resolin. We're gonna come back and buff off any extra stain we have on there. And you're gonna see that everything pops a lot nicer on that side compared to that side. This is gonna give us a little bit of a uh, glossy finish. It's gonna wipe off any of the excess stain that's kind of just wastefully sitting on the surface. <clears throat> and this is technically the last step of my staining process. Um, once the stain goes on, the job's not technically done until we do all this.
Normally I use a razor to pull this excess off, but for some reason I tried <laughs> with scissors randomly to give it a shot. And I mean, I gotta say, it's just super straight and super true to cut that stuff flush. Now what I'm doing is I'm cutting flush with the outer layer of the wallet, which then trims the other pieces of the wallet. I'm not like cutting a whole new straight line. I'm just cutting off the excess of the interior pockets here. Maybe you can get a better angle if I go like this. I'm basically using the edge of the wall, the edge of the front portion of the wallet as a guide. Um, we're pretty flush. Now we're gonna go and run it on the sanding wheel and really get the fit and finish dialed in. Getting into the edge work, we use this edge beveler. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see very well, but these angles, uh, this is kind of this loose extra material here. You can see it's a very, very kind of rough right angle. What this is going to do is remove this little triangular sheet piece of material. We're going to do that both on the inside and the outside. Which, which if you look at it, gives us a nice rounded kind of edge and feel to it rather than these aggressive, hard kind of right angles. So now I'm gonna run these edges on my polishing wheel and this should make my edges nice, slick, and shiny. Here you should be able to see a side-by-side -side comparison. I know the GoPro is not the greatest on close-up shots, but Let's uh let's wrap this bad boy up already.